terrorists coming to the city. Minister Edmund Bacon, Edmund Bartlett, and uh, Elena Contour from the European Union. Thank you so much for being with us. I will uh, now give the floor to Ms. Emma Huey from the Thank you very much, Mr. Rifai. I have a microphone, so if you want to just carry on with that one, I think you might be needing. Yeah. Does everybody have microphones? Yes. Is everybody comfortable? Sitting comfortably, then I'll begin. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you very much, the ITIC. Um, we have about a uh, sort of 45, 50 minute window, because we're going to try and keep it snappy this morning. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that London has, uh, has well, the curse of London has bitten uh, our minister from Ethiopia. I think traffic is uh, holding them up at the moment, but as soon as we've, uh, we've, we've got them, we'll pop them straight up on the stage. So let's, um, let's get going. Um, the, the purpose of this next uh, panel is, is attracting investments in tourism through incentive and conducive policies to build sustainable destinations. So we've got a big amount of wide, deep thinking to do in not very much time. Um, so let's just go back a little bit to where we had COVID a time which arguably exposed a need for joined up thinking like no other. But it's at the moment when each nation had to very quickly take its own path, closing borders, etc. As we reopen, I wonder whether we're still living in a world where borders and barriers are very much in place. For example, if you travel to one country or another, Olivia, you were mentioning that you, know, you still have to wear a mask here, you still have to do that, you still have vaccination checks everywhere. We have lots and lots of different countries working in different ways. Um, but we also have some challenges that we need to address. We have 160 million vacancies in hospitality that need to be filled. We have communities that need to directly benefit from investment and policies and in order for the, for the benefits of tourism to be reaped by all. So is there an opportunity here for a joint approach, I wonder? Can, can we have a common vision for tourism, Ms. Lefnett? So may I begin with you, Mr. Riffai? Let's, before we start looking at the, the solutions, let's try, and work, let's try and identify what the problems are first. So tell me, when you look at joined up thinking in tourism, where do you think the biggest gaps are? The biggest gap is in who we speak to, because we're speaking with each other only. So IATIC is important because it brings together the investment community, the financial community, and the tourism community. Now, we need to speak to each other, because otherwise we will be only talking to ourselves. That's the biggest challenge, I think. How about you? Well, I think the biggest challenge is to appreciate what has happened in real terms to tourism and travel as a result of the pandemic or the entrepreneurs as we call it. What has happened to the workers of the industry? What has happened to the suppliers of the industry? What has happened to the whole logistics of movement of, of goods and, and services? Um, what has happened also to the economies of the recipient countries of tourism and the source markets. So it's, it's, it's a, an analysis that needs to be done. It's a review that is impatient of time to give an empirical base on which action can now flow. And I think that um, the, the period of uncertainty that we have endured uh, and it's, in fact, it's still happening. <laughs> still great uncertainties out there. Navigating those uncertainties is, is, is the challenge. The real big challenge is how do we um, continue perhaps the iterative methods that have enabled us to journey through the pandemic and, and to reach where we are. Um, but to recognize also that in the face of all of this, the recovery has not been linear. It's an asymmetric recovery, and the care has to be understanding that the disruptions that can flow from this, this, this recovery could be worse than the disruptions from the pandemic itself. So what do you mean by the disruptions could be worse? Developing? Well, I think the biggest elephant in the room <laughs> is the supply chain disruption. That 
we've talked about in so many ways. But we narrow it down because we have to look at some of the more micro elements of it. And one of the areas is the human capital disruptions. Uh, to remember that in 2019, we employed 10.3% of the global workforce. And that was a little over 400 million people. And that the, we lost some 62 million people in the process. We must remember too that we represented uh, about 10 and a half percent of global GDP. And we are now at 6% of GDP. So we've lost 4% during that period. That's a huge disruption. To bear in mind also that some of the more tourism dependent uh, regions and countries of the world had uh, employment dependency levels of up to 89%, Aruba in the Caribbean, 89% of the workers are from tourism. New Zealand was between 20 and 25% of the workers, so that's huge. Uh, to consider what has happened to those. Uh, to consider also that more than 60% of the workers of tourism today are women. And, and the critical role that women play in the household, in, in the leadership of the household, and the, and the resources that have been disrupted as a result of that. So I think that these are the considerations that have to be brought into the mix now as we seek to reinvent, if not reset, some people say, but recover for sure, and to recover stronger and better. By one. Thank you for that. Um, I now take a leap of technological faith, and I say that I think we can be joined by um, Phil and Annie Carring, Minister of Environment and Tourism in Botswana online. Do we have them? Or try and get them. In the meantime, one thing I want to suggest to you. Oh, no, we do. I have to hang on. We'll just be patient, and, and then if you could possibly um, bear with us with this one. So let, let's bring you in. The European Union prides itself on being borderless in so many ways, free movement of people, services, goods, etc. We have this interesting thing, though, that we are talking about today, about barriers in tourism. So what barriers have you spotted and gaps? Well, the European Parliament was always um, faster than the European Commission. That's the truth. We did a lot of resolution when the pandemic hit uh, all over the world, especially the sector. The sector of travel and tourism was hit in the hardest way because everything blocked down, people couldn't travel. And uh, as a European Parliament, we actually introduced uh, restrictions and measures very fast that will um, protect destinations, the passengers, European Commission delayed to put these restrictions. This was one issue. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, sector was hit very, very hard. And the problem is that, for me, the challenge to keep alive all the small, medium uh, Enterprise. enterprises. Why? Because most of them, they suffer uh, for long time and the crisis, the economic crisis, they couldn't survive or they have a lot of debts or they have a lot of loans. So this is one of the most important things because if you think that is the 90% of the sector, right? And as my friend here, uh, which I admire very much actually because he's the one that he has the resilience and the, um, how can I say, and the sustainable uh, center that he actually uh, got all Caribbeans 2017 to get out of this climate uh, uh, huge issue, if you remember the hurricanes and everything. And he knows exactly what uh, big crisis can do in tourism. He, he was even ready when this happened. And that's why we, um, and uh, Mr. Taleb Rifai in, uh, in a big, um, 
how can I say, uh, we gave him uh, with all our hearts uh, the award of the best minister of tourism of 2018. We should not forget about those things. And I'm saying that because if we have people like him in tourism, we can do so many things and we can change so many things. So as being a minister of tourism of Greece um, for long enough, I saw how lonely you can feel if you don't have the support. So 89, 89 to 90% is the small medium enterprises that they have to survive. This is one thing. And the second thing is to have funding. So the European Parliament asked from the European Commission in the uh, next generation EU program and the recovery uh, plan uh, to make sure that all the uh, member states, they will spend, they will give a lot of money to uh, be able to survive the small, uh, medium um, enterprises. Another thing that was very important is, as uh, Dr. Rifai mentioned before, the, um, uh, how can I say, the, the economic and the social sustainability, because uh, all the communities, they have to survive, and they're not all the communities very popular. So uh, even now that uh, uh, the investments Start, the tourism start running. Of course, as was mentioned before, much less than 2019, that was really the, the year of uh, the big success of tourism. It's much less, but still started. So we hope next year will be better and the year after will be better. We need to support all the new destinations, uh, local communities, not only the popular ones. And unfortunately, with the crisis, and this is a huge challenge, and I'm closing with this, uh, it's the energy price. Uh, the tickets will go up, the um, uh, hotels, uh, the prices will go up, the inflation, the um, uh, raised cost of living, everything, everything is a big challenge for the people that they want to travel. And they want to travel because they're really, they felt very, uh, suffocated after the lockdown of pandemic and they want to continue uh, you know live their lives so um, and but also nobody has to um, be outside everybody has to be included no one has to be left alone this is another thing so everything is connected for this uh, recovery mm -hmm. we have quite to do this Thank you very much indeed for that, Ellen. And let's let's go to uh, Botswana. I ha think I have spotted uh, the Honourable Phil the Caring, Minister of Environment and Tourism in Botswana. A very good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Can you hear us? Not at the moment. If we can try and sort that out. I thank you so much. Ah. <laughs> I'm in Sharm El Sheikh in uh, Egypt, and it's a little bit of a challenge for co uh, connection. Please bear with me if my voice and uh, pictures don't come out clearly. I'm on my gadget now, but I'm here with you. And hello, everyone. I wish I was there, but uh, unfortunately, I've had to leave the president in the climate change response uh, conference here. So um, I'm stuck in Egypt for now. Being stuck in, thank you so much for your time as a result and the effort that you're going to. I think there's a little delay on the line, so we'll try and leave a little gap before we, um, before we hear, sort of hear each other speak. Um, but Minister, we were talking about the gaps in joined up thinking. This is a session about incentives and conducive policies to build sustainable destinations. From your point of view, what are the big gaps when it comes to countries talking to each other and making sure that the investment encourages joined up thinking joined up thinking has for some time been constrained by lack of harmony you know between different uh, countries different nation states even neighboring states to agree on priorities and being not at the same level in terms of policy development policy review and you know transformational strategies especially as we recover from COVID-19. We see different paces 
in terms of you know priorities in terms of mainstreaming tourism in the economic sector uh, you know and, and treating tourism as a key economic sector where it should be prioritized where it should be well resourced and where there should be connectivity because talking about tourism you know destination you're also talking about you know you know sharing of you know tourist sites like rivers like you know no don't if i may give an example uh, like you know uh, uh, biodiversity resources and if we can't agree in terms of one the priorities to you know resourcing and harmonizing and our strategies and actually agreeing on how to best build from within but also building within the blocks then we are missing you know something that can help us actually as we build from nation to sub-region to continental and then to global you know branding of, of tourism destinations it takes leadership agreeing on prioritizing tourism and you know agreeing on prioritizing resources for tourism recovery and building skills and sharing skills and harmonizing so that with the limited skills at least we can be able to access the support that we need so we miss that connectivity in terms of agreeing strategically and being at par together and at the same level you know some countries are yet to do revised tourism policies Botswana during COVID-19 we started working on a new policy that is going to respond to shocks and build a resilient sector so we, we, we have to be together, you know, and at the same pace. I think that's what we see now. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I like the tone and the, the, the kind of the energy to the words that we're getting together, to connectivity. Um, but we do have a big to-do list, so let's have a look at them one by one. Um, if I could begin with you, um, Minister. Evan, you wanted to talk about staff, people. How hard is it to make sure that when you are getting people back into tourism, that they are a the right kind of people so they are going to be their skills are suited for the job but also that you can make sure that you can draw from a bigger pool you don't just have to look locally you can bring in the right people from anywhere because that arguably would be an enormous help if you are struggling to fill jobs right <clears throat> i think one of the first things that we have to look at is perhaps just to cast back our eyes on what the labor market situation is in tourism. Now, unfortunately, because we are really a confluence of moving parts, it's sometimes difficult for us to structure and understand that there are perhaps areas that you could classify workers, that you could then develop a training program with curriculum to deal with these classification um, and then to to develop a whole program uh, like a system around it if you if you will so so that we be able to to say how to remunerate for example the workers and the type of social environment that is needed to be created for them to facilitate um, a seamless uh, movement of people within the space, but more importantly, a sense of belonging to an industry that is meaningful and that cares about them. So this morning, I, I met with a team, um, a diverse group, and we were looking at structuring something about developing a global charter to guide the, the, the whole employment situation. What is decent work in tourism. We have over time been characterized by casual employment, seasonal work. So job security has been an issue with us. Then the issue of remuneration, which is a, a, a big issue, because we don't have a specific way of doing it. We, we each do it as it relates to our business models. Uh, and then we have the question of what type of social safety net do we provide for, for the industry. In, in Jamaica, we've had situations where people have worked 45, 50 years. They're old and tired and can't retire. Because if they do, they will go into punery because there was no social safety net. I created an insurance policy for 
a pension program for the insurance, uh, sorry, for the industry. And this was a unique development, which I think is the first in the world, where by legislation, I created a contributory pension scheme where the worker and the employer contributes. But it's all workers of the entire tourism spectrum. It's not just hotel workers or restaurants or attractions. Everyone who interfaces and works with the tourism is eligible. And then we created a, a, a group that we call the Augmented Contributor. And that is those who were 59 years old and would have only six years of contribution to retirement at age 65, that they would get a pension that was equal to that of a person who started out at age 18. The government of Jamaica put one billion Jamaican dollars. It might not be a lot when we translate to US, but it means a lot at home. But that billion dollars seeded the fund. Today, because of the pandemic, the fund, the, the scheme didn't start until February of this year. And in seven months, that fund has accreted 300 million Jamaican dollars, and we have 7,000 members. Now, what that does is to give a sense of meaning to working with tourism. It says, we care for you, but also that we care about what happened to you after your productive years have passed. So that's a Jamaican scenario, but it's not everywhere. But that we would like to have everywhere because it's the kind of the thing that we think the industry needs to embrace in this new moment as we seek to reinvent ourselves. And I can see that Edmund is looking right at you when he said that. So Dr. Rifai, we have a system that we've got in place in Jamaica, but you need a few elements in place for that, don't you? You need someone like this gentleman here to hold mm -hmm. industry's feet to the fire and say, we need to do this. You need governmental incentive. We also need the private sector to say, yes, we will contribute as well. And arguably, tourism was one of those sectors as well. If you just look at how many workers were let go during the pandemic, that the speed at which workers were shed suggested that there's actually a bit of a mistrust, to, to, a bit of trust to be rebuilt now in the private sector, isn't there? So tell me how we, how we get that to go everywhere. Okay. What's happened in Jamaica is an, is an ideal story, really, because it can be imitated in other places. But the fact that workers are being dismissed now, in, in accordance to COVID, especially air, airlines, you know, some of the problem of the airlines now is that they have lost some of their workers and they can't have the entire capacity of the, of the airlines being installed. So you have many flights that are canceled now, many flights that are postponed. That's important because if, uh, if the workers don't secure their, their jobs, they will never, never ever be productive in their, in their giving. And to secure a job, you need to do this, the issue of social security as, as uh, Minister Bartlett said. In, in terms of decent work. So social security is very important, but more important also is the fact that you cannot dismiss anybody now only because he is not, he is lacking some of the privileges that they had before. And lack of the privileges is a very important uh, factor. Now, how does that translate to outside thing? It's the governments, the governments have to start first by mm -hmm. implementing these measures, the social security measures and the safety in, in, in the job you have. Because if you don't have the safety in the job, you'll never get any anywhere. Now, but Mr. Bartlett was talking about people that are 59 and above. Now, what about people that are working already now? They, are, they, they need to have security in, mm -hmm. in work. They can't continue like this. And this work security is, con is tied to and connected to government action. Unfortunately, during COVID, we had governments that did not <coughs> coordinate together their, their action. So governments working together are very important. Now, Elena spoke about the European Union, for example. European Union was not unified enough because you had, you had many governments that took 
decisions and measures that are related to travel, the infected travel, that are different from one another. Now, tourism brings one, one group of people from one place to another. If these two places are not similar in their systems, they will not be, they will not be tourism. Sure. Can I add something on that? Because okay. it's very important. As I said before, um, uh, we ask for the recovery uh, plan, which the member states take, and they do a national recovery plan. Where do they put the money? We ask uh, Commissioner Breton to give a direction, 20% to be on the tourism sector. Why? Because the tourism sector, as uh, uh, the minister mentioned, uh, is um, the driving force for other sectors. Like, for example, Greece and uh, Jamaica, they have a huge GDP uh, living from uh, tourism. So there is culture, there is um, uh, entertainment, there is um, uh, restaurants. It's the whole hospitality sector that benefits from uh, tourism. So all the workers, and this is so important, especially in the red season, uh, they have not even one day off. They work very hard, and sometimes they work 12, 16, 18 hours, and I'm not joking mm -hmm. because in Greece I can see that. So the public sector has to work together with the private sector, not only for the security, but also for the seasonal um, uh, time of uh, working, because if, if uh, a worker <coughs> works six months, then he goes to unemployment, um, uh, uh, which is something like uh, not even one third of his salary, just to survive for the next six months till he gets back his work. And as Mr. Talib, if I mention what happened with all these uh, uh, people that they um, uh, lost their jobs or they left the job, uh, that they had uh, during COVID because they had to survive somehow. Uh, it's very important to say that this phenomenon of great resignation created a huge chaos between the countries and the traveling and also in the same country because, and that's why we asked this money, they should go also for uh, the workforce for upskilling and reskilling because of course you can find people, but if they have no experience, they cannot serve well. And you know, uh, human uh, forces is the most important for a destination. When the visitors are going there, they need to be uh, happy. And for them to be happy, the workers, they should be happy. And they should uh, get paid uh, well so they can survive, they can provide to their family, and not worry that after a month, I'm going to be unemployed. So it's a huge issue. That's why in this next generation EU, the parliament ask, and also the um, uh, recovery plan, all the member states, and this of course should happen to all over the world, but I'm talking about European Union because uh, we know the needs, everybody to consider uh, and, and uh, uh, change the rules about the workforce. They should get paid better, they should get work enough not to exhaust themselves, and they should uh, uh, remain in this sector through the year somehow if we want to provide a good service and, and, and have a, a hospitality that you know, can be competitive with other countries. I think they might be doing something a little bit like this. And from what I heard, I could be wrong, that they are making sure that if you work in a hotel, you're paid for the entire year. You work for the time that's why open, but your salary is maintained. The government, that's why I said we have to work with the private sector. The government has to give incentives to the private sector to make sure that they will do this uh, um, uh, program for the workforce. Yes. Thank so, you. so if I'm, okay. because I think this is where the charter would come in, where it's it's not one glove fitting all, but it's a broad framework that will give guidance as to how we behave in the work environment. What's the responsibility of the worker to the employer? What's the responsibility of of the government in all of this? Um, and so the, the whole idea 
that it is an ecosystem that has to be created with a number of key players and partners. Um, and if we could, in this whole idea of reinventing, uh, create some support, some intellectual support for the industry to guide it in terms of developing these labor market arrangements, I think we would be well away to making the industry more attractive and to use a frame I think that my friend Adrano used this more, makes it more sexy mm -hmm. and more appealing. Because, team, the hard cold facts are there are still 44 million people who left the industry who have not seen it fit to come back. And that 44 million uh, could be a huge portion of, 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 the, of the critical asset of the industry, the historic uh, memory of the industry, with great values that we've lost. So we have that to contend with, but the next key thing that we have to contend with is the new players, because we have to be attractive. It's a new industry that is emerging. It's a new demographic that's emerging. We're talking about Generation Zers now, and I thought about Generation COVID, Generation C, I call them. It's, it's a whole brand new set of psychographic profiles that are emerging in the market that we have to respond to. And then there's technology, which is redefining the way that in experiences are now determined, created, defined. Um, what are the new skill sets that are now going to be required to respond to these critical changes in the sector? So it's for us not a quiet moment, it's a very active moment where our minds have to really get going at ethic pace to create and invent and innovate uh, and to adapt and pivot. And, and that's how we're going to recover well, is if we have built in that capacity to, to innovate, to adapt, to pivot. I think we can still get the uh, line up from, uh, forgive me, I'm going to get the Botswana point of view while we actually have a collect connection. I'm sort of seizing an opportunity here. Um, let's join you once again, um, Minister. Uh, thank you for sticking with us on the line from Sharm El Sheikh. But one word that comes up quite a lot in this is community. And the fact that we're trying to invest, attract investment into countries so that new thriving tourism locations can, can grow and grow and grow. But when you have an enormous hotel chain that lands in a very beautiful place, yes, you have local people coming in and serving and helping and, 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 and maintaining that, um, that hotel, but quite a lot of the money doesn't stay in the community. So, um, Minister, from the Botswana, Botswana point of view, how can you attract lots and lots of investment but make sure that it stays in Botswana? All right, before I get there, if you allow me just half a minute to comment on the labor issues and skills development within the tourism industry, I think I really agree with the ministers that it's important for us to come up with labor-related policies and the programs that can help us actually to build the capacities and the skills. But for us in Botswana, we are also working on a tripartite agreement with the private sector operators in the tourism industry and the trade unions to, to, to domesticate the decent uh, work program of ILO so that we... we, 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 we I think, we, I think we might have to... Interventions. The situation here, help me pass the line of the fellow minister has said, capacitated through the many years of retire to become successful and able tourism I hate to interrupt, but I think we might have to abandon the line a little bit to, to, to Sharm El Sheikh. Okay, that has been working in that in while, throughout their service. We can't to later hear, which is a great shame because she'd launched into something rather brilliant about joint uh, perspectives and joint initiatives. Um, let's talk about community for a moment. We'll do the joint perspectives if we get it back. Um, how do you make sure that you can attract I, I, investment, I, I, I get your uh, point, itself, and keep it in the country? The investment itself must connect itself to the surrounding communities. They, they should buy their food from these communities. So the community 
would respond by creating their own self-employment. They should buy food. They should buy all their needs from the, from the community. That's not just for tourism, for any, any project that's invested. And it's not enough to, to create jobs for these people and bring them to you. You have to help them create their own jobs. That's the only way that it will work. And uh, the, the tourism sector, unfortunately, when a big hotel is built in a poor community, I know that in India, for example, there was a, 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 a big uh, revolt against one of the hotels, one of the famous hotels in the south of India because the people there felt that this, this hotel is taking away all of their, uh, their resources and selling it to others. So it's very important that the, the local community feels that anybody that comes to this hotel comes to them. So how do we build an inclusive, uh, uh, a conducive and incentive policy to make people invest just enough and take out just enough so that everybody gets a fair share of the pie. Okay, that's the government policy. Yeah. Government policies have to be geared into that direction. And what we hear from Minister Bartlett is very important because the minister is representing a sector in a country that's so dependent on tourism. So if the governments don't act in the right way, everything will be lost, definitely. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I totally agree. Um, the governments, they have to take um, uh, decisions, first of all, to make uh, the community survive. I used to be a minister, so I speak uh, with two hats. Because, uh, as I said before, I felt so alone. Uh, the Ministry of Tourism is such a productive uh, ministry. It brings a lot of money and brings a lot of cash in a short period of time. And there are a lot of sectors depending from tourism. So for the community to get advantage, uh, if we think that only the 10% are hotels and the 90% are small, medium uh, uh, enterprises uh, and family business, um, they have to have incentives. So this is a government decision. Why? Because, for example, my country, Greece, takes the recovery plan, makes a national plan, and leaves all the small, medium uh, enterprises outside. Why? Because they don't have uh, the requires for getting uh, subsidies and loans. Four out of 100 uh, enterprises, only they can get uh, the money to uh, develop and uh, become better. So it's totally government choice. And it's very important to say that uh, in order to uh, have investments, I know uh, as a Minister of Tourism, but also as a member of the European Parliament, that um, uh, to make inve uh, investments in destinations that they're important, um, first of all, you need to have safety. The second thing that you have to have is the possibility to invest in different kind of um, uh, uh, touristic opportunities. Um, and the third thing, which is very important also for big investments, is um, uh, the um, stability and the clarity. If there is a lot of bureaucracy, if there is a lot of obstacles to be able to invest in a country, then it's uh, something that the big investors, they will think about and they will leave. So you have to make the structure and the guidelines and everything to work in the benefit of uh, the investors. So this is more or less. Thank you. Good news. I think we have our Minister from Botswana back on the line. Unfortunately, we can't see her, but we're going to hear her. Can, um, Minister, can we hear? Can you hear us? We tried. We'll try okay, and get so, back if we so can. So perhaps I can chip yes, in of here because I think that. Um, I can hear, mm. but it looks like okay. I, I, I can't be heard myself, so I don't know how it will work. I tried to type some of my points on the chat. If we can, we will try. Um, Minister, yes. we can hear you. There's a little bit of a delay on the line, but if you just tell us what you need to tell us, and if we can hear you, it will be a wonderful thing. I Go wanted to say, 
I wanted to say that in Botswana, with the new policy and the reset agenda, we are actually opening up for what you call value chains in tourism. In the value chains, a hotel that is receiving clients will be working with the communities to procure some of the things that they need from the local <laughs> suppliers in a, a, a formalized manner, like transportation, like the baskets and crafts, like music and food, so that these are provided by the communities around. When we have an event, a conference, in that hotel we provide space for small and medium scale enterprises to display and sell their products. We also devolve transportation and catering and decoration and other services that I needed for that event to local suppliers, which are mainly young people and women and community-based you know, operations. So we ensure that you don't concentrate all the services to one operator, but we can unpack it for others through our research agenda. That is what makes us to be able to provide opportunities for everyone. Thank you very much indeed for that. I think we've got a very good shopping list there. Um, one thing I want to come back to you, um, Minister, is these are all good ideas. However, we're facing another economic crisis. Do we have time to do this? That's a good question. Um, but what's the other question? Can we afford not to do it? And therefore, the time to do it has to be now. And so, yes, we have time to do it. One of the things about us human beings is is the capacity to, to adapt and to think and to innovate and to find answers. Uh, if we don't, then we will be extinct. So we are driven by that reality that we must find answers. And the pandemic showed us that even when an event that became as potentially existential as the pandemic never before entire world was en en enveloped in a single um, action, event, situation. We found answers. We, we then drew on our science and data. We found answers through iterations, but we found answers. So we will find answers, and we have to find them now. And I think that one of the big areas that we need to examine is how we invest. What is the new investment? climate that has now to be created? What is this post-pandemic recovery period demanding of us and our investment? Is the investment for the investors alone, or is this now investment for, as Dr. Rafai says, the community? Is it our investment? The issues of ESG, does that mean anything? Do, do we look at the environment and the social impact of our investments? We have been talking about that in our I have in Jamaica, and I like to give examples, because we're now looking at about 15,000 new rooms that are coming on investment between now and 2027. Next year alone, we'll bring in 3,000. But what that means is that you're going to need 20,000 more workers. What that means is that you're going to need housing accommodation for workers, because otherwise you're going to have an overrun in communities with carrying capacity issues and then social disorder, instability, crime, and other antisocial action. So the thinking of investment has to embrace all of that. How do we enable investment to be holistic that brings into play the social and economic realities of the communities around which the investment? And I think that that is the new order that must define how investments move. Dr. Rafai, who takes the lead on all this? Because we have good ideas flowing in. We've heard quite a few in the last 45 minutes, things that we could probably all take back to our respective homes and think about putting in place. But is it here, is it ITIC, is it UNWTO, is it the, well, you know, the WHO talking about safety and, and COVID regulations? What the minister said is very important because what the minister said is that governments are responsible for creating the environment. It's the environment that is important. This environment has to do with many things. It has to do first with the rights of these workers. 
but it also has to do with the community at, at large. For example, if a hotel is all inclusive hotel, that limits the number of, uh, of uh, action that these hoteliers can make towards the community. And the government has to create the system that would help and encourage these investors to take more out of, uh, out of the local community. And they can do that. They can do that by creating a, a tax system or a, an incentive system that helps and promotes that, that concept. That's very important. We have uh, just a couple of moments. Um, so let me ask, does anybody have a question that they want to raise? Oh, here we go. <laughs> right, OK. Uh, there's a gentleman who had his hand raised at the end. I think that might be the last, last question. We'll pass the microphone to him. Thank you. You could just introduce yourself and tell us what your question is and who you're, who you're directing it to. Oh, thank you. My name is Maurice Kusotera. I'm um, from Polar Plus Healthcare Limited here in the UK and also African Tourism Showcase. Oh. Uh, so I'd like to thank, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Dr. Talib Rifai for supporting us with the initiative of the African Tourism Showcase, which we created. And he has been there for us twice as a guest of honor and six times as an attendee for our sessions. The second thing is uh, the points that were raised this morning are of interest. Um, and Honorable Minister, you spoke about the, the issue of um, a healthy workforce. Because a healthy workforce is a wealthy workforce. Which, is, which we have seen in the pandemic, that people will, who are healthy will go and visit and be happy. So we are advocating for healthy tourism, for health, health investment, or, tourism or investment in health in to, you know, within various facilities. So my question is, how can we help or how can we make it that our African governments in Africa invest a lot in defense or in other facilities instead of health? How can we really push forward for universal health care, which we have seen that, which is funded centrally by governments for, the, you know, for free access of health care? Because that is the fundamental a point, like Honorable Minister, you have mentioned about pensions, security, and um, you know the well-being of the workforce, and how can we take this to Africa? That is the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, this has suddenly become uh, rather lively. So, Ellen, do you want to take a look at that? Because obviously, as a as a representative in a in a group of twenty seven member states, you have a certain amount of budget. You have priorities. What would be your response? That well, I totally agree that health is much more important, but also security is very important. So each country makes her choices. It depends how many friends has and how many enemies has. So um, I, I cannot say that it's the same for everybody. For example, uh, Greece has uh, a neighbor that uh, is not that friendly and attacks all the time. So we must be uh, verbally attacks. So we have to be ready and have a good defense system. But of course, we cannot avoid to have a good healthy system. So the government takes a decision. Now, a country like Germany um, maybe uh, invest much more, uh, used to invest much more uh, in health uh, uh, issues, but now, and not in defense, but this year, mm -hmm. uh, what is happening in Ukraine and Russia, you see, spent uh, more, I think, uh, 200 million in defense. So it depends. I totally agree that the core of our policies should be people. So health, it's very important. But also security, it's very important. So each country, I think, decides, depends on their needs. And unfortunately, I want to close with this, this um, um, war that is happening. Uh, right now and, and, and uh, creates also uh, huge problems all over the world, not only in Europe, with the energy crisis. Um, so us that we have to have a balance, not only as a European Parliament or, or European Union, 
but also um, all over the world, global balances, because what is most important really? Uh, the uh, human uh, life and security or uh, goods? Thank you very much indeed for that. I think we've run out of time. So thank you so much to my panel, uh, to the Honourable Edwin Bartlett, Minister of Tourism from Jamaica, thank you. Uh, Phil and Nanny Caring on the line from Sharm El Sheikh, if you can still hear us, heartfelt thanks to you <laughs> and your sterling efforts. Um, Elena Kuntura, Member of the European Parliament, and also uh, Dr. Talab Rifai, thank you so much for your time. I think that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you so much.